We don't believe in that, guys, so I don't know why you know what that is. <laughs> Trick question. Um, no, hey, my name is Anthony. If we have never met, nice to meet you. If it's your first time here at Cottonwood Church, or it's your, just your first time at Cottonwood, congratulations, because you have made it basically halfway through your first service. Uh, normally, we start the way we just did, where we all come in here, and we, we sing a couple songs, we worship. Right now, we're going to go to the Bible, and we're going to read the Bible. I'm going to teach from the Bible, and in these moments, uh, we actually think that God's Spirit can speak to us in a unique and in a special way. Uh, I'll give kind of a... Uh, uh, an overview just to say that what today is, is today's basically going to be part one of a five-part series that we're going to start that I'll go into in just, a sec uh, in just a second. But I think this morning we'll have something for everybody in here. So whether you come to church all the time or you have never been before or anywhere in between, uh, I think that what God wants to say can actually be really relevant and helpful for you in your relationship with Jesus. So before we go to the Bible, let's go ahead and pray, and I'm going to open that. Perfect. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we get this space to be in. Thank you so much that as we gather together, God, we know that you're here, and we know that you want to speak to us. And God, we just ask that this morning, as we turn to your word, uh, Lord, that you would grace me with the ability to hear from you, that you would speak to every single one of us individually and say what it is that you want to say. Thank you for encouraging those of us who really need it. Thank you for lifting some of our heads to see you in a fresh and in a new way this morning. Help us block out distractions. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, as you can see on the screen, thank you. Um, it, it's fine. It's cool. It, <laughs> uh, thank you so much. But as you can see on the screens, so what? We're in a new theme this month called so what? We just finished a theme last month that was all about asking for a friend. This month we're asking the question, so what? And I'll explain what I mean. We talk about God all the time. If you come to church, you're going to hear us talk about God. You're going to hear us talking about Jesus. But sometimes I think some of us have the follow-up question, so what? Like, you can sit in church and you can hear a message about God, but then you can kind of, it's time to leave, and you're like, well, well, what does that have to do with me? So what? Like, that's good for God, that's great to hear, but what does that actually have to do with me? And this month, we're going to look at the character of God, but we are going to consider the question, so what? Okay, that's what God's like, that's what God says, but what does that actually have to do with me? And the reason we're going to look at God and we're going to look at the character of God is probably not what you think. We're not going to look at God uh, just because we're in church. We're not going to look at God just because we don't have anything else to talk about. We're going to look at God because God is an organizing idea. And that shouldn't make any sense. Let me explain. An organizing idea is one idea that you have or that I have that kind of frames how we think about everything else. I'll give you a real classic example. If you've ever had a friend who got in a relationship with somebody else, they were your friend and they were single and you hung out all the time and they were great and they were cool and they had good taste in music and movies and it was like, yeah, this, this thing really works. And then they get a boyfriend or they get a girlfriend and all of a sudden they're different and they don't have time for you anymore and they have different tastes in music and they have different tastes in movies. Like if you've ever seen somebody change because of a relationship, that relationship becomes an organizing idea. That relationship is the reason that they think differently, they act differently. That relationship is kind of an organizing idea that affects all their other thoughts and decisions. And there's a famous, there's, there's an old famous Christian writer who has this line that he says, whatever we think about when we think of God is the most important thing about us. In other words, the most important organizing idea that we can have is what we think about God. Like, if you think that God is forgiving and he's merciful and he's really nice, then when you sin, you won't be tempted to run away from God. You'll actually be tempted to run towards God because you know he's going to forgive me, he's going to embrace me, he's going to be there for me. However, if you think that God isn't real or you think that God doesn't really care about you or you think that he's, just, he's up there but he's way too distant to actually make a difference in your life, over time you're going to probably end up walking away. What you think and what you decide to do, both in your relationship with God and in your relationship with other people, is going to be determined 
by what you think God is like. Like, what, what do we actually think his personality is like? And there's a, story, uh, there's a story in the book of Exodus. And if you're not familiar with your Bible, your Bible has 66 different books, okay? Uh, it, we, we think of it as one book because they're all bound together for us. Uh, but there's 66 different books, and they are t- they're supposed to be read all together. The book of Exodus is the second book in your Bible. So it's really early on in the story, all right? Uh, In the book of Exodus, there is a story about a guy named Moses. And some of you would be familiar with the character of Moses. Uh, In the story, Moses is born as an Israelite into the nation of Egypt. Now, the Israelites are slaves in Egypt. So Egypt is the superpower. Egypt is in charge. Egypt is oppressing the Israelites. Moses, he has a bit of of a unique story that we're not going to get into today, but there's a story about Moses where he's walking through Egypt, and he sees one of the Egyptians mistreating an Israelite, one of his people. He gets upset, so he kills the Egyptian, just right on the spot, kills the guy. Uh, When you kill an Egyptian in Egypt, you're probably going to die. So Moses realizes this, so he runs away from Egypt, and he basically starts a new life. Uh, he starts a new life, he gets married, he has a kid, he's doing pretty good for himself, he becomes a shepherd, he has like animals that he takes care of, and there's a story about him after all this, where God shows up to him, and what Moses wants to know is, well, God, what are you even like? What Moses wants to know is, God, are you, are you actually good? Are you actually faithful? Are you actually trustworthy? Uh, In the story, God shows up to Moses, and uh, it's the story of the burning bush. Some of you would be familiar with it. Moses is taking care of his animals, and he's on a mountain when all of a sudden a bush catches on fire, and God starts speaking to Moses from the bush. Now, if you can imagine uh, watching someone in the park having a conversation with a tree, like this has to look a little funny, but Moses is having a conversation with this bush, and God tells him, Moses, I actually want you to go back to Egypt, and I want you to rescue the Israelites. I want you to go back to the superpower that is Egypt, and I want you to march up to their leader, Pharaoh, and I want you to tell him, hey, God said, let my people go. And Moses understandably has reservations, because if you remember, he's kind of a wanted man, and he understands, hey, when I go up to Pharaoh and I say, let these people go, like the people who are your workforce, the people who make everything happen here, if I say that, Pharaoh can just kill me on the spot. So there's a lot at stake here if Moses actually wants to accept this invitation And then God tries to comfort him, and God goes, Moses, don't worry. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you. And then Moses asks the question that's going to be really important for us today. He goes, well, well, what are you even like? It's almost like Moses understands an organizing idea. Because when God says, I'm going to be with you, that's that's not enough. Moses goes, "Well, well, you can be with me, but are you more powerful than Egypt? Are you more powerful than Pharaoh and the power that he has? Because if you're not more powerful than them, it doesn't matter if you go with me. I'm going to die. God, you can say that you're going to be with me, but what about when I make mistakes? What about when I fail? What about when I sin? If you leave people when they are doing bad, then it doesn't matter if you promise to be with me because, well, well, you're probably going to end up leaving. Moses understands the power of what we believe about God is actually the most important thing about us. It's going to determine how we live, what we do, what we won't do, how we'll step out in faith, or how we will hide and shrink back from challenges. It all comes back to, God, God, who are you? And in the story, Exodus chapter 3, we'll throw up verse 13 on the screen. Uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 13, I think it's verse 13, uh, It says, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Uh, Keep that verse on the screen, but look at me really fast. Moses says, hey, what's your name? And the reason he asked for, for the reason Moses wants to know God's name is because in this culture, your name said something about your character. Some of you know the, the song, uh, Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had father. I was kind of hoping we'd sing it, but never mind, okay? The, when, when God shows, no, it's too late, guys, it's too late. When God shows up to Abraham, Abraham's name isn't even Abraham. Abraham's name is Abram. Uh, God ends up having an interaction with Abram, and he says, I'm going to change your name to Abraham. Abraham. Abraham means father of a multitude or father of many nations. The reason... 
God changes his name is because in this culture, someone's name said something significantly important about their character. So when Moses goes, God, what's your name? This is him asking the question, God, what are you even like? Uh, What shall I tell them? And then we'll go to verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. I don't know if you ever kind of read your Bible like for answers and then you walk away with more questions. Because Moses goes, God, what's your name? And he goes, I am. (laughs) I am. Like, bro, that's not an answer, okay? He wants to know, God, what are you like? And he says, I am. I am who I am. Now, as confusing as that might sound, there's actually something uh, very instructive and helpful for us in this interaction. I want you to notice that Moses doesn't assume he knows everything about the God he's talking to. Moses lets God define himself, and when God defines himself, he defines himself without limits. We usually do the opposite of this. When we think of God or when we want to define God or relate to God, we tend to relate to God based off of the characteristics that we like most about God. If you ask me, Anthony, who is God? I'm like, well, he's loving and he's caring and he's forgiving. And I kind of put my favorite parts about God towards the top of the list. And yet when God describes himself, he goes, I am. Like I just, I just am. I actually don't have any limits. I don't have any boundaries. There, there, there's nothing that I'm insufficient in. I have no limits. There's a, uh, there's a great line by, uh, one of my favorite, favorite, by one of my favorite writers. He's a philosopher. Uh, and he talks about how a lot of people come to God. And when they go to God, they're not actually looking to understand what God is like. But they want to find in God something that supports what they're like. And he, he has this line, he says, we look for an ally where we're given a master and a judge. In other words, God is not like us. He's so much more. God isn't what we think he is. God isn't what we want him to be. He is who he is. He is so much bigger than we can understand. And I am, I am not uh, meaning to infer in any way that we don't know anything about God. I just mean to say we'll never know everything about God. We'll never understand him in his in- infiniteness because he just is. And the reason this is so important, the reason this is really, really important for our walk with God is because When we put God in a box, when we say, hey, here's who God is. He is loving and he is kind and he is merciful. And we kind of just list out these character qualities and we say, yeah, that's what God is like. Without even realizing it, we can close ourselves off to more of God. We can close ourselves off to more of the person of God that he has yet to show us. I'll say it this way. In following Jesus, we should have moments where God surprises us. Like, we should have moments where we're just hanging out and we're like, man, to be honest, I really don't like that person uh, and they're really annoying and I just, I, I, man, I can't stand them. I do not like when they're around. And then God shows up and some way he goes, I really love them. Like, they're made in my image. I love them. I love them so much. I care about them a lot. Or we should have moments where we're like, God, you just forgive everything and this is awesome and you are so nice and you are so kind and you are so accepting and you are so loving and then we read in our Bibles and we read verses where God says things like uh, when you have Christians who are living life of public sin I don't even want you to associate with them and we should go wait a second wait wait God that doesn't sound very nice or forgiving because God is way more than what we know God is actually way bigger than what we can even imagine. In following Jesus, there should be moments where the things that God wants us to do should feel a little bit scary and a little bit confusing and a little bit like, wait a second, God, that, that, seems, a little, that seems a little extra. You want me to like, you want me to like get on my knees and worship? That, that just, ah, it's too much. You want me to like pray for a sick person like who I don't know? 
you want me to, you want me to, to talk to my friends about this thing that they keep on doing that I know is not good for them? There should be moments where we follow, we follow Jesus and he reveals something about himself and it should be a little bit challenging because God is who he is. And that's actually, that's actually his name. Remember, uh, remember verse 13, God says, hey, what's your name? And God says, I am. Uh, in verse 15, can we go to the, the next verse? Verse 15, God also said to Moses, I want you to say to the Israelites, the Lord, and then he talks about who he's God over, has sent me to you. Say to the Israelites, the Lord. And if you notice, Lord is in all capital letters. Uh, let, me, let me nerd out on you for like two minutes, okay? This is going to be a little technical, but if you stay with me, it's going to make the ending better, all right? Uh, when the Bible says the Lord, remember when God said, I am? That was his name, okay? Moses is like, what's your name? And God goes, I am. If you didn't know this, your uh, Old Testament was actually written in Hebrew. It was not written in English. Uh, your Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Your New Testament was written in Greek. And there's a little bit of Aramaic in there uh, kind of diced around. But the Hebrew word for when God says, I am, which is his name, is pronounced something like, eh, yeah. All right? Something like that. I'm not good at, I'm not good at Hebrew. It's pronounced something like that. That means, I am. That's what God says. He says, I am. But when God tells Moses what he's supposed to tell the Israelites, God says, I want you to tell them Yahweh. That's the Hebrew word, okay? So when God's talking, he says, eh, yeah. But when he tells Moses what to say, he says, Yahweh. Because it wouldn't make any sense if Moses goes to the Israelites and he's like, I am sent me, okay? That doesn't make any sense. He's talking in the first person. So Moses has to say, he is. And that's where we get the word Yahweh. Uh, however... Over the years, Jewish scribes have been very intentional with not, taking the, uh, with not taking God's name in vain. So what they do is whenever they translate Yahweh, they translate it uh, with the word Lord, which is a title that is supposed to signify respect and admiration. So uh, when you read your Old Testament, that's when you see Lord in all capital letters. Whenever you see Lord in all capital letters, that is referring to God's actual name, which is Yahweh, which means he is. Uh, if you have any more questions about Hebrew languages, you can ask Evan and he will clarify everything that I just said. But that's the most basic form of what I'm trying to get at here. And here's the point that I'm making. God actually has a name. Moses goes, hey, what's your name? And he gives him a name, and his name isn't God. God is a title, uh, kind of like doctor or professor is a title. But God's name here in this story is Yahweh. And what it means is, well, he is. Who is he? He, he is who he is. He's, he's bigger than we can understand. He's more complex than we can imagine. There are parts about him that are going to surprise us forever he is. And you can only imagine Moses has to be wondering, like, God, okay, you are, but what are you actually like? And in this story, God doesn't actually say. Now, I'm just talking about this story. So in my Bible, it's like right here. It's like, it's like yeah, it's right there. I'm not thinking about the rest of the Bible right now. In this story, God doesn't actually tell Moses exactly what he's like. He just says, I am. I am who I am. Now, from the context of the story, we can, uh, we can start to conclude a little bit of what God is like. Because remember, God shows up to Moses, and Moses at this point has committed murder. God doesn't hold that against him. He shows up to Moses, and he still wants to talk to Moses. So apparently, in some way, God must be forgiving because Moses has some stuff in his past, and God is not holding that against him. So, okay, God's forgiving. Not only does God show up to Moses... But he tells Moses, hey, I have a purpose for your life. Okay, so God is also the source of purpose. And then God actually reveals that purpose, and he says, I want you to go rescue some people who are currently enslaved. So God cares about people who are hurting, and God cares about people who can't fight for themselves. Okay, so God's compassionate. Uh, God says, I'm going to strike down Egypt for the oppression that it is committing. Okay, so God cares about justice, and 
injustice actually bothers him to the point that he wants to do something about it. So just from the story alone, we can kind of see, all right, God, well, you're obviously forgiving and you obviously have purpose for people and you want people to help other people and you care about injustice. But remember Moses' question, God, who are you? Like, what are you actually like? Because God invites Moses into a relationship where Moses is supposed to do something that takes a lot of faith, that takes a lot of courage, that's really scary, and that it, he's risking everything. Moses has kind of set up a nice life for himself. He's got a wife, he's got a kid, he's got animals to take care of, he's obviously providing for himself. And yet, God shows up and says, Moses, I actually want you to take this step of faith. And it's within that context where Moses goes, okay, God, but but what are you like? Because my life is kind of good right now. I don't, is it going to be better? And this is where God says, I am. In other words, Moses, if you want to find out, you actually have to follow me. Moses, if you want to find out what I'm like, if you want to find out whether or not I'm going to be faithful, if you want to find out how powerful I can be, you have, to fo- you have to follow me and you actually have to step into a relationship with me. And this is, uh, here's why this part is so important. Because when we talk about God, we're going to talk about God all month. Sometimes we can talk about God like he's just like this subject. Like, You have textbooks that you have for class, and we're like, okay, let's learn about God, and let's see what God is like out there, and let's let's create lists where we understand, okay, God is this, and God is that, and God is this, and God is that. But God tells Moses, if you want to know what I'm like, you actually have to step into a relationship with me that is, uh, the whole relationship is defined by how you obey me and how you help other people. Those are the defining marks of the relationship. Moses, or God tells Moses, hey, I want you to be in a relationship with me, but by the way, I'm going to ask you to go do some scary stuff. I'm going to ask you to put your life on the line to help other people. I'm going to ask you to put your comfort aside so that you can help other people. And if you will obey me and you will dedicate yourself to serving and loving other people, it's within that context, you're going to find out who I am. You're going to find out just how great I actually am. And here is the application for all of us today. This is the so what question. Okay, God's big, God's complex, God is maybe confusing at times. All right, but, but, but what is he actually like? If we want to find out, we have to follow him. If you want to find out how faithful God is, You actually have to try to follow him for an extended period of time so you can see how he shows up time and time again. If you want to find out how powerful God is, you have to put yourself in positions where you're like, okay, I'm actually going to pray for a miracle. If you want to find out how loving God is, you have to find yourself, you you have to go to him with your sin and you have to go to him in your brokenness and you have to say, can you please help me? If we want to discover more about God, uh, sometimes we can take the attitude where we're like, okay, well, I learned about God in church, so this is where I come, and this is where I kind of learn about who he's like. God says, I'm so much bigger than that. I, I said this last week, like every message that we preach here, it's going to be a little incomplete because I only got like 20, 25 minutes to talk about God. And he says, if you want to find out who I am, you do that when you follow me. You do that when you dedicate your life to obeying me and to loving other people. And this month, that's what we're going to try to do. I said this is only going to be part one of uh, what we're going to talk about this month. Uh, This month, we're going to talk about how we can obey God. We're going to talk about who he is and how we can obey him. And we're going to talk about how we can love other people. Uh, If you come on Wednesday nights, we are actually, this Wednesday, we are going to launch a bit of a donation project that we're going to do for a uh, for an organization that ha- that has a um, basically a foster care system for some young people who would be your age or maybe a little bit younger, 
uh, we are going to rally together and pull together our resources to be a blessing to them. If you're familiar with Cottonwood, you know that every October we do this thing called H4, which is when, as a church, we raise money for some specific initiatives, and we'll have some more information about that as well. But the reason we do that stuff, number one, it's a response to what we believe God has done for us. But number two, God says, if you want to find out who I am, you actually do that when you obey me and when you try to love other people. And this month, uh, we are going to do that collectively as a group where we're going to go, okay, God, what is the next step of faith that I have to take? And what does that look like in relationship to other people? What does that look like when it comes to the people who you go to school with? What does that look like when it comes to your family? What does that look like when it comes to people who you don't know and yet they're hurting and they're struggling and God wants to use us to help them? He says, I am who I am. So today, that is what I kind of want to leave us with is if you want to know more about God, it's going to happen when you follow him and when you try to help other people. And we're going to try to provide spaces where we can all do that together this month. But I want to challenge you, even as you leave today, uh, what is the next step of faith that God is asking you to take? And who is the person who you know you can start helping in a greater way?